Welcome, friends and fiends of the pod. I'm your host, film critic and comedian Nate Wyckoff, reminding you to like, subscribe, and go to cultandclassicfilms.com, where you can purchase exclusive cult ultra-low-budget films from us. And you can also subscribe and have them delivered monthly at a big discount to your door every month. So don't miss out on that. And unlike Roddy Rowdy Piper here in They Live, you don't need special glasses to see these deals. All right, so please, thank you, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Cult and Classic. <laughs> Welcome everyone to another episode of Cult and Classic, the film podcast where we review a mainstream film, albeit perhaps on the edges, and a less common cult film with a similar theme. This week we have got a martial arts bundle for you. We have Undefeatable 1993's, one of 1993's efforts by Cynthia Rothrock, one of my all-time favorites and 1998's The Process, known more commonly in the States as The Ultimate Fight uh, by Ernie Reyes Jr. So I'm excited to get into these. With me, as usual, is Jeffrey Tucker. Hey, Jeff. Hey, what's up? I'm business on top, pajamas on the bottom. Ah, that's good. Good time. And uh, Tad Mastriani. I'm wearing pants. That's... I appreciate it. That was the one request we had when starting this podcast is Tad has to wear pants. <laughs> Yes. All right. Uh, I'm really excited. Just a, a note to our listeners um, who who may be concerned. There are uh, some some instances of foul language and uh, some ethnic slurs in the clips for these films. If you're uh, uncomfortable with that, I'm not sure what you're doing watching a cult film podcast or listening to a cult film podcast because you're going to come across that. Uh, first up, we've got Undefeatable with Cynthia Rothrock. I love Cynthia Rothrock. She is a five-time world champ, I uh, believe karate. Am I, am I correct in that? should know. But uh, she's a master and also a weapons master. And she had a really successful stint of direct-to-video films in the 90s and, and late 80s. And she's still actually acting, although uh, she's, she's not doing as much martial arting in the films uh, these days. Jeff, what were you feeling about this? Um... I actually, I thought there was like a couple like of the fight scenes that like I got really excited about and we can talk about that later. There's some kind of homages to other things that were happening in pop culture at the time. Um, I Very thought much. that it had some uh, kind of pacing issues. Um, but uh, yeah, overall I thought it was a, a fun film. Yeah, so the, the actual plot for this film is uh, on the surface pretty standard uh, 90s you know, Kung Fu Karate auction fair, right? Like you've got uh, Cynthia Rothrock is the bad kid. Her sister's the good kid. They don't have any parents. So Cynthia Rothrock is, is, is performing in, in fights where they bet on the winner uh, to get some extra cash to help put her sister through college. Uh, but of course, things run afoul when a, a crazy murderer rapist uh, kills her sister. There's, there's a lot to unpack in there that isn't even <laughs> clear. By the yeah. the plot, um, the the villain is played by um, uh, Don Yam, who's I, I don't I'm not familiar with his other work, but he he can mug for days. That face, his intense <laughs> stare, dream. those eyes. I mean, uh, what was your take on that, Tad? Um, so I I did a little research just prior because I'd never seen Undefeatable before. I think that's going to be a recurring theme with our podcast is Tad's never seen this movie before. And uh, turns out, I didn't realize this, but this movie actually uh, was a huge YouTube meme back in like 2006 due to the end fight. Mm. <laughs> so I looked up, uh, I looked up Don Neum, is that his name? Don, Don Naim, I, I think. It's, Don it's Naim. N, Don Neum, it's N-I-A-M. So apologies to Don if, if we mispronounce that. I, I wanted to see what this guy looked like now. I mean, I am always interested, especially with these old movies from the 90s. It's always interesting to see how they look now. And this guy is discount Sylvester Stallone. Huh. It's just too bad that his acting chops don't ma mesh with that. He, so he has this fantastic, like, 80s mullet, right? <laughs> like, it's super, super curly and just, just, just swept back. And he, he makes sure that it's very in every he's always a three-quarter angle shot and you can see this mullet um he's ripped i mean he's definitely fit in this movie um, he's still ripped yeah yeah that's kind of his thing we, we also have john miller who plays the uh the the good-hearted cop trying to help cynthia rothrock into a better better time let's let's take a quick 
look at a clip here or listen to a clip here. This is uh, Cynthia Rothrock talking to uh, John Miller as a cop. Christy, you make this working in a diner? Come on. What are you guys picking on me for? So I make a little bit of money on the side. Big deal. I have bills to pay. I have a sister in college. <laughs> Cops. Why aren't you out doing your job arresting murderers and rapists instead of arresting innocent people? There's this preppy looking kid outside asking for her. Claims to be her sister. Damn, Karen's here. So this is pretty much verbatim what I say every time I get pulled over for a speeding ticket is why aren't the cops arresting other people? Uh, I have to say, <laughs> this is kind of a sign of, of something that I thought was interesting is the movie, it, you would, on the surface, it's a very cookie cutter, you know, direct to video actioner, but really there's a couple of things they just kind of squeeze in there. Like uh, the cops are kind of stupid. Like they're not, they're not really excellent at anything. Um, Cynthia Rothrock's character does all of the detective work, and really, and uh, you aren't really sure why they're bothering with her little alleyway fights. I mean, they're not fights to the death. It's what, like the person's left hand has to touch the ground, something yep. like that. Uh, <laughs> I don't really understand what the issue is, uh, to be honest. I guess betting, I, I don't know, $600 is what she wins for her first match in this film, which, I mean... That, I don't know that that's really the huge issue that the cops are making it out to be in this scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like some of the dialogue is actually poking fun at the, the, the concept of the script itself. Mm. I would hope so. <laughs> I would, that's, and that's, and that's because there's some real questionable, real questionable dialogue in this film. <laughs> there's also some real questionable. Um, I've decided to read the script verbatim. <laughs> oh, oh, and, yeah, and actually, a lot of dialogue too for an action film. There is, and uh, according to uh, according to an interview that Cynthia Rothrock did, some of the people were so bad at remembering their lines that she actually had at one point uh, their lines taped to her forehead. I for some of these mm. somehow I somehow I just got that impression, <laughs> and you can tell because it's like you know the difference between someone who's acting as a character who has dreams, hopes, fears, feelings, responses, and someone who's like reading the lines like they know the lines but they're delivering them not as though they have any meaning it's like you could be yeah. you know you could be reciting a, a prayer in in swahili and they wouldn't it would be the same effect I've, they have no concept what they're saying yeah. uh one thing i'll say about uh, both these films but undefeatable as well as I, I don't know what happened in the 2000s where movies stopped having people of color in them because each of these films have a ton of people of color. And it's not just people that, um, you know, know martial arts, although that's a big part of it, I think is, is, mm. is these crews. But I mean, there were, there were, there was a black martial artist that she fought. There's of course, Asian martial artists, there's white martial. I mean, it's just, there's, there's a lot of different uh, ethnicities that work in these films. And then you, it's like you jump to the 2000s from the 90s and all of a sudden we have this, uh, um, this, this whitewashing effect where every single film has tons of white people. And mm. that's pretty much it. And it's weird. And I don't know, I don't know what changed, um, but I did notice that it was noticeable watching these movies versus what I'd see today on the direct video rack. Mm. I did notice that uh, uh, it's, uh, um, Don Niem or Niem's character definitely seemed to have a, a, a diversity streak going on with his murders. <laughs> right. Yeah. I thought it was, so the, the reason it's this, there's some depth to this movie that I don't, it's not necessarily done expertly, but I thought was an interesting way to attempt it. I mean, Godfrey Ho uh, is the director of this film and he's a Hong Kong director who it's really fun to look up his uh, aliases for movies. Cause there are like 30 gajillion. I mean, I stopped counting at like 28 or something. Um, as to what he's he's directed under. But um, he directed films up until 2002. And I wanna say, I mean, there's a massive number of films. I wanna say they, somebody, somebody wrote that he, he did like almost 70 films, um, which, you know, for, for Hong Kong cinema, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and in the US, that's of course unheard of, right? Like mm -hmm. you, no director, I mean, Tarantino, granted he takes a long time to do projects, but he's done what, six? you know yeah, it's like, like two a year for a 35 year year career that's pretty crazy right so it, you know you get um even even more 
um, more, even Donald Farmer hasn't reached that level of, uh, of turning out films. But um, this one, the, although there's the typical victimization of women that happens in lots of cinema, including cult cinema and mainstream cinema, you know, the, the, the bad guy kills women because if he were killing guys in their 30s, we probably wouldn't care. Um, there is some societal construct going on there. But the women in this film actually have some agency, which I thought was interesting. I mean, mm. it's not just that Cynthia Rothrock is the badass of the film for the most part. She does most of the fighting. Um, but you have the therapist character who's uh, played uh, by Donna Jason, who also worked with Cynthia Rothrock the same year on um, Honor and Glory, which is a much lighter film, but but a lot of fun. Rift Tracks did it, I believe, last year. Uh, so that's extra fun. If you if you like that stuff, check it out. But she plays the therapist of um, the the killer's wife, and uh, she urges in the beginning of the film uh, the the wife to leave uh, Stingray, which is a hilarious name, uh, who's Don Iam's character, and she does. She leaves him and leaves him a, a goodbye note, and we never see her again. Um, and that's I thought kind of interesting because it puts you know part of the backstory for the villain is, oh, he's gone crazy because his wife left him. Turns out his mom left him too back in the day, so on, so on, so on. Um, it's a flimsy argument. I think most people who suffer loss do not become serial rapist murderers. But yeah. um, it, it was an attempt where I feel like often we don't even bother getting that. You know, so-and-so is an asshole because they're an asshole and now they're going to get killed. Like that's the the target. And they did try and give some sort of... Um, 10 till midnight Charles Bronson movie uh, mental state of the villain, which is interesting, although it's yeah. odd. Well, um, I mean, they play a lot more into the kind of like pseudo psychology stuff later. Right. Um, yeah. And the therapist, she has this great bit um, when she's captured uh, by, by Don's character and um, he's this really disturbing scene. He's got her bent over a table and he's calling her his wife. And you don't know, is it going to be a rape? He starts to take up her clothes and she whips around and slaps him and starts berating him. Like she's his mother and it works, right? Like it, it, he stops and he treats he her sort of like for a second. Yeah. And that was, and I thought that that was a, uh, not only did Donna Jason play that scene really well, <laughs> but um, it was something I, I just didn't expect from what I, you know, on the surface looks to be just a, a, a enjoyable but run-of-the-mill actioner. So that there's there's these moments of shine through like that where we get something extra. Yeah, My so like that that particular movie. scene, I, I I agree. I thought she played it very well. Um, and like, you know, one of the things my takeaway is like, what what was this guy's diagnosis? Like, it's like this kind of weird. Yeah. Like, is he schizophrenic? Is he, you know? Uh, it, like at that point he's clearly not just doing some sort of like masochistic like role play with these women it's like he's legitimately crazy in some uh some manner yeah well and i mean they don't so many films uh at the time and i i've seen it less which is is i guess nice um they they have rape as like this ultimate evil which i don't think any of us will argue that it isn't um but they use it in such a trash cliched way that it really it makes it seem just incredibly exploitative and that's coming from someone who is a big fan of exploitation cinema as a whole um but i i was shocked in this film early on like the event that um immediately precedes don's wife leaving him is uh is he he comes home and she's making him dinner and he comes home from a fight where he brutally beat a man uh presumably to death and he rapes her and that was a very uncomfortable scene because it was shockingly realistic uh yeah. i felt like i mean she's she's sobbing it's not really played for sexual thrills which i think is the easy way out that would have been done in so many cases yeah. for these films um you know where it's like oh it's terrible but oh it's clearly fantasy and oh they're naked now like it that's not the way it is it's very uncomfortable yeah. uh it ends with her like just emotionally shut down on the ground and him this is the weird hilarious part is him eating like a bloody raw steak and what <laughs> appears to be raw vegetables just yeah, like, like seared on one side yeah come eat your come eat your dinner uh i'm not hungry anymore i'm like i wouldn't be hungry at that f at all that is uh raw meat uh <laughs> but, 
Yeah. And I was reminded of it later because when he comes home and finds her letter saying that she's left him, she's like, I made your favorite meal. I don't know what the hell that meal was. It was like raw veggies on a plate of lettuce. Uh, I don't like what was there? No, like, I don't know. I guess if you're making the film, you're like, well, I don't, we don't want to cook anything. I'm just like, yeah, then don't, e- don't even include it. <laughs> don't even yeah. include that. I don't understand yeah. what the raw broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, also I just want to mention the name of this film is Undefeatable. Uh, can we can we agree that that's not a word? Yeah, no, I, it's not a word. I don't. I mean, like, I don't. I don't even care what Merriam-Webster says. I, it's not a word. Nobody says Undefeatable. I have gone through life having seen this movie for y- years and years, and gone through life constantly saying Undefeated, and I keep having to correct myself that it is Undefeatable, which probably is part of the reason why this film is not super well known uh, it's probably I think, the least poetic word like <laughs> that you could possibly string together it's like undefeatable the film that embiggens the kung fu genre and <laughs> bigly i, I I'm, I'm not even sure why it's called undefeatable because i'm pretty sure either. everyone in this movie gets beat at least once oh, yeah well i mean the guy is quite undefeatable until he's defeated <laughs> i mean he's an unstoppable madman and uh you know, absolutely until, unstopable because no one knows how to tra- no one knows how to track a man down where they know exactly where he lives what his name is and where he operates <laughs> yeah i don't uh mm, i just i don't i don't get it uh and and just to clarify because i know that people are going to be uh leaping on me for this it's just primarily uh kung fu um, that Rothrock is 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 known for, which makes sense since she is, of course, uh, does a lot of did a lot of Hong Kong cinema. Uh, she was an undefeated middleweight kickboxing and weapons lady champ for five consecutive years, which is pretty amazing. Um, so she's she's the real deal, and that is, I think, one of the reasons why it was so great to have her in movies. But one complaint I have, and it's so many of her films are this way, they still insist on having. Um, a male co-star that has to be a big driving force like she's Mm. not just like we didn't need the cop he he's unimportant um uh and with that said uh, i think i don't think he's as strong an actor as she is i'm talking of course about john miller not that he's terrible uh he plays a villain in honor and glory the same year uh with uh rothrock and donna jason and uh, he chews the scenery in that, like 100%. Like he, he is breaking blood vessels, trying to mug and pose, and, and it's a lot. And so to see him in this, I was actually surprised when he plays the, the police officer, Nick DeMarco, uh, which I don't know why we really even have his full name. It's not, like, he's okay. He's fine. Like, he's fine. But next to Rothrock, she actually gives some reasonable human responses. Like when... Uh, she's frustrated that she's gotten arrested after that first fight in the clip we heard. And then when she sees her sister's body, um, she has a very, I thought, I mean, I've never lost a sibling, but I don't even have any siblings to lose. Maybe I did, but uh, she has a very reasonable upset crying jag. That's, that's seemed pretty on the ball. Mm. Um, Interesting fact as well about that. uh, The story goes that um, the, her sister played by uh, Sonny David uh, was unpaid. And uh, so she left and uh, before the film was complete. And so they didn't have her to be laying down for uh, Rothrock to act to as she's looking at her dead. And so she just, uh, I think Godfrey Ho, they said he used his hand. He held it low off camera and said, this is your dead sister. And Cynthia Rothrock had to respond to his hand. So that taken in, yeah, you know. Uh, Commendable performance, considering. Yeah, yeah, yep. My also, hand has gravitas. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for, those, for those interested in, uh, in what the sister went on to do, uh, IMDb is incorrect, uh, as it often is. Her, her, her name is apparently Sonny David. It is not the Sonny David who is well known for writing music um uh, in in elvis movies where a whole lot of shaking going on things like that um definitely not the same person so uh 
bad on you, IMDb, bad on you. Uh, there's one thing that we haven't quite gotten to in this movie yet that is absolutely uh, batshit nuts, which is Don Am's flashback to when his mom left him after his wife leaves him. Um, <laughs> let's, let's take a listen to this. This is, this is him sitting on a staircase, listening to a musical locket that he's staring at uh, and, and having a vision tired of this shit, woman. I ain't taking care of him. It's just for tonight. I don't care if it's for one minute. I'm with you, not your kid. What do you want me to do? That ain't my problem. You can get rid of him for all I care. He's my kid. If I have to take second place to him, I'm gone. No, please. Mommy, don't go. This, this sounds like a bad table read by producers. <laughs> you know, like, um, like, no, please. Like the bo- the little kid is by far the best actor in that scene, and we don't even <laughs> see the faces of the other two. I mean, the the wife. I mean, the mother is like, uh, oh, no, no don't go, don't go. Like it's the it's just terrible. Um, it's also really, uh, it's it's very theatrical in that it's it seems like it was directed by a theater person because we don't see the heads or the faces of the the mother and the man that she's arguing with but they're walking around the little boy who's on a bicycle outside and i think it's i think it's a black and white right at this point they're walking around him maybe it just seemed like they're black and white but it's definitely got a filter on and they're just walking around him having this conversation in a constantly moving circle while he looks at them it's the weirdest you know it's the weirdest thing um and uh, i mean so a- actually if you kind of compare that to like our first introduction to stingray it almost is like his memories are happening in almost like a fever dream kind of that's fashion fair like, point you 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 see like the the first boxing match it, it's it is not like in front of a crowd or, or anything mm-hmm. it's, it, it the lighting is kind of very harsh and um you know it feels kind of like a memory and there's some slow so mm-hmm. um like an event that, that happened in this film yeah and i think so I, I think that's kind of like i mean i'm taking a stretch here but it's kind of going to like the psychology of the character and like kind of the way that he, he like sees the world well and one thing i in that vein I felt like it's so easy for these movies to go off into insane psychobabble that means absolutely nothing and has therapists cringing across the country. But yeah. <laughs> when, when uh, uh, the, the cop character of Nick interviews uh, Donna Jason's character, uh, the therapist who, who encouraged you know, this, this woman to leave her abusive husband, I, it actually was fairly reasonable. She doesn't go off the rolls. She actually says, I don't know at one point. He's like, mm-hmm. you know, because because I think the MO of him as a killer, right, is that he he abuses these women. Uh, it doesn't, it don't, s- rapes them apparently, and then gouges out their eyes, which we don't even know until like partway through. Uh, we, and, and listeners, we reviewed a VHS transfer of this. It's, it's what I had for a million years ago. And it, um, it, the quality is questionable. It, this is on DVD, so you can get a higher quality. But even that, it's not like it's remastered. So um, the gore effects when we see the sister's eye sockets is unexpected for, for this movie because there's no, there's no other real special effects, per se. Um, mm-hmm. So I was surprised that they put the effort into that. I mean, they frankly, another film probably just would have said, close your eyes, poured ketchup in her sockets, and been like, You're, you have no eyes now. Um, but they went beyond that and did some applique. Above and beyond. Uh, above and beyond. Um, I think that this movie is, it's definitely not the best uh, Cynthia Rothrock's films. I think probably China O'Brien one or two somewhere along the lines would, would be the best or um, Yes, Madame, which is where she first appeared with Michelle Yeoh, who phenomenal. But it's, I think it's the most memorable because mm-hmm. it's weird. Um, mm-hmm. It's weird. And my favorite thing about this film is the final, the ending to the final battle. Uh, Cynthia Rothrock's character and uh, you know her her pol- at this point her police co-star, uh, our Nick, uh, John Miller, are fighting Don Yam's character in I don't know basement number a million, 
um, of some, where is it even? The hospital? Brat? We don't, uh, yeah, it's, a hospital, it's hospital, like a hospital, I guess. Warehouse hospital. slash hospital. <laughs> All, it just like, like both of these films, Undefeated and The Process, have a never ending supply of empty warehouses and empty industrial <laughs> parks. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, it's, it's by far my favorite because oftentimes these films, I love the choreography. And this, this choreography, I'd rate it a B to B plus. It's not, yeah. it's not as good as, say, some of the choreography, which we'll get to in the process, but it's good. And it's also based a lot in real martial arts at, rather than a theatrical um, you know, Chinese mm -hmm. opera or stunt based. Like it, it's, it's very much, you know, we are martial artists. This is how we would spar and we're pretending it's for real, which is nice to see. Um, but... Oftentimes, you know, it's a final kick or someone grabs someone's neck and snaps their neck. And it's a very easy, non-special uh, effect laden way to be like, oh, this is the death of the villain. They did not do that for Undefeatable. They were like, no, 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 this is, this, we're going to, we're going to make it a, a multi-part affair. So first, uh, I think it's, it's, is it, I don't remember who does it. They knock uh, Niamh's character onto against a wall, and there happens to be a nail sticking out, right? No, I so, thought it was like a, I don't know, some sort of like hook. conveyor system, like almost that, like a that's dry the end. Can... That's the end. The first part is he oh, loses okay. one eye because he's knocked against a wall where they have a, a, a nail that used to hang something, and so and he comes off and he's got one eye put out, which is already like, oh, that's that's a little more, that's a little extra, and then uh, a few <laughs> beats later, he is he is knocked onto a like hanging grappling hook that's hooked up to a skybound conveyor i don't yeah. know i don't in know in the basement it, of a hospital I, I, yeah i don't know what like i mean do you have that many it's corpses dry cleaning yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they're hooking bales of hay down there for their off time i don't know uh but and so he's got both his eyes gouged out he's on this hook and then nick demarco's character hits like i guess the on button for this contraption and it <laughs> hoists hoist Donian's character up by the eye socket into the sky and just carries him off across the room slowly as he's kicking and throbbing that to me i was like oh this movie this movie wins the final yeah. battle because right, i got uh, so many comments on this because <laughs> this actually this ties back to an earlier scene and and this was uh the first time i got really excited about the action like i did enjoy the earlier bits Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I do like it when you know essentially the stunt people are doing the yeah the action um you know because there's there's no you know you're not looking at the back of their head for half the scenes and like all those things are great uh, but it was the scene in the parking lot which was framed exactly like a uh, fighting game it, essentially <laughs> uh, a, a scene from <laughs> Mortal Kombat it was like directly from it they were fighting on a like literal like two-dimensional plane and it even had like an environmental effect where he knocked the guy out of the parking lot <laughs> onto a car. It was it was it was Mortal Kombat, yeah. and I was like, oh my god, that's that must be inspired by Mortal Kombat. I looked it up. This movie came out exactly one year after Mortal Kombat One, um, so there's no way that's a coincidence. <laughs> and then you get to the to kind of the near the end of the the film, and you have the um, the John Miller character. Uh, and the Don Nam character both get shirtless with back black pants on. It is li you could literally take <laughs> a frame of Leo Kang and uh, Johnny Cage, and it's just that. It was it's literally in the same framing of them, uh, you know, looking at each other on a two dimensional plane, and then they kind of start fighting, and then the movie ends with a fatality. And I was like, oh yeah, this, this is where the, it was like it just kind of all came together for me. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. Yeah. Art inspires art. Uh, type oh my thing. god! I was like, "Damn, this is awesome! I love it!" Oh my god, Nate. <laughs> Cynthia Rothrock is uh, Sonya Blade. Sonya Blade. There actually, I, I don't know where this came, but there was in the '90s. There was like a uh, a research, a fan cast that was like Cynthia Rothrock needs to play Sonya Blade, and I think that she very much is the prototype for Sonya Blade. Like, I mean, she was around, yeah. you know, at the at the time. Like, this was like, oh, like especially when you look, if you look uh, at at the DVD cover of Undefeatable. Uh, if you're watching the video of this, we have it here. Uh, she's wearing very much Sonya Blade's outfit, right? Like a crop top yeah. with pants, like that's it. Um, I totally believe she inspired a character in Mortal Kombat and then the scenes in this movie, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful it's, little it's circle. Full it? circle, full <laughs> circle. 
Um, we, we haven't got quite to my favorite, favorite part of this fight, though, which is actually after he's been hoisted up into the sky. Let me, let me play this oh, clip. God. Keep an eye out for you, Stingray. Yeah. See ya. They couldn't, they ah. couldn't choose between those two lines to end this eye gouging death scene. So they're like, we got two characters. Let's just throw them in there. Oh, I, and I mean, and I'm, and I applaud them for using the weaker line second when you would normally expect a build up. I'm like, <laughs> was this? I'm just like, did John Miller just like, nah, like let's yeah. just? I, I thought of this on the spot. I'm gonna say it. It's gonna be funny. See ya. And. <laughs> It's it's not, and it's terrible. Bad puns. That's hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. Um, I mean, the whole film though is kind of filled with like those one-liners. It really was yeah. chock full of them. Uh, yeah. And so I love that they doubled up at the. End. They did. So they really, really <laughs> bringing it home for the climax. Sure. And it was like we know what this is. We know why you're here, and we're gonna give it to you, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I think <laughs> that. I actually think the dialogue in general, because as you said, Jeff, there was a lot of it. Uh, I think it probably could have, it could have been strengthened just by changing some of the lines. Like there's a lot of stock lines in here, especially from yeah. uh, John Miller's character as the cop. You know, Nick Marcos is always saying things like, uh, why don't you do it? You could get a job. You're a nice kid. Mm -hmm. And it so, just, it's meaningless. Yeah. I actually think the movie would have been just improved by editing. Uh, yeah you move you move the spousal rape scene to the very beginning of the film mm -hmm. uh, you get people in on the villain like right away act one starts because he is right the strongest off. part in a way because it is it, it really you know. draws you into the film you start to care about the characters and you're like you know you, you hate this fucking guy right and yeah. you know you can drive by liking characters or hating by characters um and so that that part needed to be in the beginning uh, but they also needed to, i think because we liked the therapist She's an interesting mm -hmm. character. They needed to have the kidnapping of the therapist like way earlier mm -hmm. and maybe have more scenes with Stingray and the therapist. And, like, she could have been he held kills. captive. Exactly. She yeah. should have been held captive for a long period of time. Maybe even have a few murders happen while she was captive. Mm -hmm. It would have it would have increased the tension because because what happens is like the tension is very low up until yeah. that rape scene. And then it gets low again because yeah. he's just kind of murdering random people that look the same as his wife mm -hmm. um it just needed i, I think it would have been by the way don't look the if, same at all if, <laughs> yeah you know it, it, i feel like it would have been an excellent film if they just kind of rearranged the ordering of things happening um yeah. and really played that tension throughout the whole film and th there's literally a reason why most films and tv shows that have serial killers also kidnap people and mm -hmm. hold them for a long time it's a tension builder. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's how you build tension. It's you have a character that's like in a hole, you know, putting lotion on their skin that you're like, <laughs> there's a race against the clock to save this person. Right, right. Um, you have to have that kind of tension. Uh -huh. builder. And yeah, it's uh, true. And there is no, it's just a body count movie in the middle um, where there is, there is, there is a little bit of nudity. There's one woman that he kills who is topless. Although frankly, I can't tell if that's the case. Are the it's, VHS no quality? Is, it's like, yeah, I'm pretty it's like sure. A body suit I'm pretty like sure that. they gave. They, I'm pretty sure they animated out. You know, they gave her a couple of uh, pasties, skin color pasties, and we're like, she's not kidding. You're like, no, she's not. But that's fine. Uh, I don't really need. To, I don't really need to see that. Um, like there was doll. there was a great scene um, that actually I thought was executed really well, which is when um, Don Yam's villain is. He, I don't know, he's just coming out of a restaurant or a building and he runs into this woman, uh, this attractive woman who's carrying something like a box and it spills out on the ground. And he's like, oh, let me help you. And he's very kind and picks it up and puts it back and hands it to her. And you know, his demeanor is different. He actually looks like a normal person, a handsome muscle guy. And she's like hitting on him profusely. And he's just like, um, I don't know. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I'm gonna go. And then like he sees, a uh, woman wearing a, a floral dress, which was his wife wore. And so, which I guess she wore every day. I don't, I, they could have gone into more of that. Cause I mean, maybe he's controlling and he liked that dress. Like that would have made sense, but they just like, nope, she always wore floral dresses every day and had curly hair. Um, but he or sees this other person. the last thing he saw and it's like locked his, I don't know, man. Yeah, There's like they, some weird psychology. They could have done something there, but he sees this other woman wearing a floral dress and he's like, I have to go. And like this woman who's been hitting on him, who he was very kind to is like, 
really? Like no response at all. And like, it was this, it was a really great way to show without telling that whole dichotomy that he had to have had, right? Because he's apparently living in the world at the same time as he's committing these murders. Um, there's also, he's like part of a death ring fight circuit where he's going to get like a million bucks and that's not related to the film at all. <laughs> like the police are wasting time on a $600 alleyway game of, you know, rough tag. And, and there's these million dollar murder fights happening. And they're they're like, they were completely and utterly irrelevant. Like hit the fact yeah. that he was in that ring had no bearing on the plot no. whatsoever. No, Plus, I mean, I, if you, what you could do is name you could was make Stingray, it. They're like, oh, Oh, just what you could do is you could be like, they're trying to find those death fights. And right. so they're starting with. Yeah, I thought there would like be a buildup, you know, but no, nope, totally like, unrelated. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you go, you go to the dealer of the meth to find the maker of the meth. You know what I mean? It's like, you kind of like escalated. But yeah. They didn't, they never played that out. And there's, there's some other thing like his, his, his fight manager like goes to find him and then he finds his like murder warehouse. And uh, there's this crazy scene where he's looking in this fish tank, which, okay, warehouses have fish tanks, I guess. And there's like uh, just a bunch of these eyes at the bottom of the tank. And they, they're, they look like real eyes. I don't, I think they're maybe cow eyes or something. There's they're some animal eyes and is it's disturbing to be like, Oh, that's gross. <laughs> You yeah. know? And again, it was a touch that I hadn't expected. The fight promoter was even like, why does this guy have a fish full of a uh, fish tank full of eyeballs? I'm like, and I was watching the movie going, that's exactly what I just asked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're like, and then he also has a giant freezer where he's really lazy at putting his dead bodies. Like the, this woman's legs are hanging out. Like, we, were, right out. we were having a good time. You're like, what, what is happening here? Like, why? <laughs> Like, where did this come in? Why does it, what goes from murdering them in the warehouse to the freezer to then dump their body off at like that same day? Like, I don't understand his process. We didn't get that. Um, we, they alluded to a lot of torture. Like we saw, he liked to have women like chained to the wall, you know, like um, sort of uh, uh, medieval style in mm. this warehouse, but, and then he'd pull out a sword and it was, you know, you anticipated a really disturbing scene, but they didn't really have it. Right, it would cut right before you know the blade hit or something. So it was definitely not a movie for gore hounds, but it was probably mm. a little more than most action fans were expecting. So it's right in the middle uh, on that. I think it's a a funky film because it of is, that for sure. Uh, so so who here's a question, Jeff? Who would you recommend this film to? Um, I, I mean, I think like anybody who really loves like fight scenes, like uh, you know some good, you know. Uh, you know, choreographed action fight scenes. Uh, I think they're quite good. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess if you really love, you know, mysteries and, you know, finding the serial killer, I guess you could get into it as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I just say like the, you know, hardcore action. Tad, what do you think? Fans. This is a movie for people who enjoy the backyard wrestling of street fights. Mm. <laughs> that is a fair it's it's got a kind of a uh like very skilled people but a homemade feel like mm -hmm. this is and it's very much i mean this this movie has production values it's not a uh a, a high school assignment like it's a very solid middle of the road like 90s it does feel a little older like it's 1993 but i feel like it's still stuck in the 89 ish yeah. area of, of production vibe. um the difference being is that uh cynthia rothrock uh rocks a very 90s outfit the whole time and it, it does change <laughs> like it does change you know the 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 like zuba pants and like the um leather jacket she's always got a leather jacket on uh it's kind of an and and, and there's characters with like she's a hat at one point right like those weird cotton militant hats i can't remember so the characters wearing weird things and each street gang is sort of warriors ish they all have like their theme um you know, matching outfit. Yeah. Oh my God. That, that first, that first street fight scene with her where it's like, they're like, all right, get it going. And like the, the, um, the, the, the gang of, of people supporting the black athletes start like stomping the wall. Like they're yeah. against the brick wall. Backwards like, stomping the wall. the wall, which and is probably other... what got them called on the cops called on them in the first place. Oh, right. They're like, noise complaint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm a noise complaint. Oh, it just so happens. I broke up a giant street fight. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hilarious. And it's also, they clap like the other group then claps like Cynthia Rothrocks and 
they did that thing where two things totally blew my mind about this. Not only did uh, they like film people clapping off of the soundtrack, like it's like clap, 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 like that. They also recorded ADR of people clapping and stomping off beat. Like it, there's no beat. Like it's just a cacophony. It's like it's like if you gave a bunch of people from Stomp Adderall and the rest, you know, Quaaludes, and then you had them like now perform, it just didn't mm. match at all. And it was this weird West Side Story, you know, meets a, a post Bruce Lee death knockoff film from the seventies. I that that caught my attention. I love that scene though. I, I thought just that it was great. Kind of the, 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 I guess the contrast to like, you know, the, the quality of the fight and just like the awkwardness of the crowd. Yeah. That it, it felt like really real. Almost. Yeah. It felt like the kind of thing, like if, if, if you called me, Jeff, and you're like, Hey, there's going to be like a street fight competition in, you know, behind the Applebee's I'd have been like, I, let's go. And we'd have gone. And this is what we would have seen. Like yeah. some people had the idea and they were kind of like, okay, guys, like you clap. But like, don't see like super like like pr- practiced because that's kind of like stupid. You yeah, because like if everyone's in unison, it, it 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 almost it's like okay, did these like did this group of people go and like you know practice? Is this like the flash right. mob of, right. of fight scenes? They like practice their their timing on the stomps <laughs> and the, <laughs> they, and the outfits. The, the outfits are so '90s that I have I thought I'm like, is somebody gonna start beatboxing over this? Like. It, it literally looked like maybe we would get like a beatbox or like a freestyle rap worked in, you know, and, uh, and I, and I didn't, didn't get that. We'll have to wait till ultimate fight to get to that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I would recommend undefeatable to Cynthia Rothrock fans, of course, but also uh, people who, who are tired of action films that don't have, surprising elements because there were some moments in this where i was like oh i thought i knew where this was going because of how every other movie i've seen uh like it and it sort of bucked the trend a little bit and don yam is actually a pretty good villain i don't really know uh i don't know how much is acting and how much is he just has the right look and vibe but he, he pulled it off and it was nice got to... rest, resting bitch face or resting serial killer <laughs> I mean, face or... i mean i was <laughs> I, yeah, I was most engaged by his scenes. Um, so that yeah. plus the choreography was, was just a nice, it was a nice treat. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely, like, certain films really are, like, driven by the villain. Like, yeah. you know, they're the most interesting thing. They're, like, the thing that makes you want to see what happens. And I and this film totally falls into that. And, mm-hmm. like, I, I don't know what it was, like, but he was compelling. Like, I, I can't explain why he was compelling, but he was compelling when he was on the screen. He really brought the intensity to it. Like, I, it's got yeah. to take some sort of concentration and knowledge of your your physical uh, emanations when you can just look for almost all of your scenes. Like, he has very little lines. Um, yeah. and, and he does it. And he committed 100%, which is, is more than you can say for some of the weird little side characters here and then. You know, the, I'm delivering my lines. I normally work inside that restaurant. You know, like that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah nothing against restaurant employees. I'm very grateful for you. I do not like to cook. Uh, so let's move on to the next film. This film, I think Tad and I saw it maybe 15 years ago the first time. It would be my guess, my rough estimate. Um, it is called uh, The Ultimate Fight in the US. Uh, the actual title, original title is The Process, which I never knew. Um, and knowing that going in this time for this rewatch, it was hilarious to me how many times Bernie Ray's Jr. says, the process, man, because it means nothing. And it has no relation to the script. It has no relation to anything. It's never referenced after maybe the halfway mark of the movie. Um, and uh, Ernie Ray's also wrote the script. So I, let's, just, let's just get the plot here. Uh, so there is, there's a character uh, referred to as Pinoy, who is um, a, a Filipino martial artist. Um, he's, he's played by Shashir Inokala, who I probably have butchered his name, but I, I feel bad for it because he is phenomenal. He is mm-hmm. such a good martial artist. He plays the fights amazing. And his, his whole demeanor as, you know, this, um, and I don't mean this derogatorily, but the, the fresh off the boat immigrant who kind of has to deal with this crazy circumstance that he just falls into and other people's pull him into. Um, he does it really well. He's, he's very humble. He's, he's like the perfect, um, he's played as like a Christ figure here. Um, kind of, I mean, that's really being heavy handed, but, 
I was going to well, say. Well, there's, there's <laughs> references. It's right. It's intended to be that way. Um, it, and, and basically, he, he's uh, forced to, we assume forced, for whatever reason, to fight in death fights uh, in the Philippines. And so um, we don't know if it's his master or his father tells him, like, go to the U.S., find yourself, be a guiding light for others. And so he just shows up in, how they, where are they? Like in sort of like mid Washington. Are they in Washington? I think they were in Washington State. Okay, because it's sort of like it could be that, but it could also be like rural New York. Like there's there's a town and there's people, but they live on a farm. It's a it's a it, it's not a halfway they walk house from to get to the city. To, get to the city. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand the geographical complications <laughs> of this place. Um, but there's uh, so basically Ernie Reyes Jr. is this punk kid who lives with a bunch of other punk kids who no kung fu uh or or filipino fighting uh, various martial arts actually uh at this um this it's a foster home which is a farm which is uh run by uh, uh, a character who is actually ernie ray's uh, senior uh who I, I guess i don't know if it's his the old woman is his wife or just his friend there's this white old lady who shows up occasionally and she apparently was a missionary in the philippines but she never speaks any other language and she's british i assume I, I don't know it was like a it was like a weird proper uh british lady talking through a betty white hand puppet i don't know what was going on with that um but th there this it's like all the i don't know how old anyone is in this foster home like one one of the female characters she's clearly like maybe 12 13 the one one is supposed to be like a hooker on the side and and she's i don't know how old she was she looks like she's maybe 16 um ernie mays jr looks young probably younger than he really was at the time of this filming um then there's a couple other characters that are just kind of there um ernie mays jr big fan first off anybody who loves the ninja turtles uh will tell you that ernie mays jr as the pizza boy in teenage mutant ninja turtles 2 secret of the ooze was a dream uh i loved him he also uh was usually donatello in the suit for the first film um uh the the staff fighting is was is one of his specialties and so he did a lot of that choreography um his father also very good choreographer it's on display in this film kind of the whole time um this is the most 90s attempt at a 90s film ever like it's not just trying to be 90s but it's also more than actually 90s like um ernie Mays jr and the other people just walk around in like windbreaker uh uh track suits um uh, with with racing stripes and and just like constantly doing like the shoulder arm motions always smoking cigarettes um always sitting on things cross-legged and uh and and shouting motherfucker and weirdly poetic nonsensical language all the time this is a perfect mm -hmm. this is a perfect example let's 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 play this. Uh, let's play this clip here. This is from the beginning of the film. Uh, Ernie Reyes Jr. is walking up to, I guess, another gang who have matching workout uniforms, who are all like lined up on a West Side Story scaffolding. Keep an eye out for you, Stingray. That would be very funny if that was the clip. Here's the clip. <laughs> <laughs> Stingray <laughs> snuck into this mill. This is a <laughs> What a fucking powerful villain. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yo! Yo, motherfucker! Yeah, you see me over here. Listen up, it's time to listen up. Do you got the gold that I want or what? Now what? Come over here and let me express my affinity for yin and yang exactly to annihilate your ass. What's up, motherfuckers? Yeah, come on, chase me, you little bitches. I knew you would. Look, I don't know what Ernie Riz Jr. said in this, but apparently it was some dirty shit because they get mad at him and they run after him. But that is the <laughs> weirdest language. Like, I'm pretty, like, is he free? I'm pretty sure he's freestyling, right? Because that couldn't have been in this There is so way. much ad living in this movie. I, I'm sorry, but this movie has almost no dialogue. It is literally just a series of monologues. It starts <laughs> with the monologue of the dude, like the dad or dude on the. The Ernie Ray Shooters. This I'm is like senior, the second yeah. monologue of like a hundred monologues. Yeah. It's, it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that brings this me is a to a character this. movie. Oh, totally. And that brings me to I don't so Ernie Ray Jr. is 
um, is credited with directing this film. Um, and I'm sure he did, but I don't know if there was like a second unit director who took over a lot of it, who was very much a theater, physical theater person, because this film, it's, it's like a stage play almost all the time, except for the fight scenes. Like um, the plot is, uh, you know, Pinoy comes to the US, he ends up getting, helping out uh, Ernie Reyes Jr. who just pissed off a bunch of these guys while trying to steal their drugs basically. Um, and yeah, he like lure he he taunted them to lure them to steal their drugs, which makes no sense at all. Which makes he, no sense because yeah. he lures them. He would have gotten beat up. Yeah, a, a, if Pinoy hadn't showed up, and then he takes the drugs. Like that's not luring. Why did you even lure them away? Like that you just I, had them meet you. Like it, it was. Make, it, it was. It's it didn't make sense. But he has <laughs> that happen. But it gets weirder because uh, Pinoy then starts living at this foster home. Uh, with these guys who have constant run-ins with this other gang and the other gang is selling drugs for uh, a character known as Hitler who is played by a uh, Corin Nimick who is uh, he's a working actor um, he's actually a pretty strong actor in a lot of his work in this particular one I have zero knowledge of what planet uh, the person who conceived of this character lives on because his name is Hitler. He occasionally puts on a little like Hitler mustache. Um, he slicks his hair down. He also uh, is a, uh, apparently a transvestite, not a transgender individual, but a transvestite. He likes to wear um, red lace undergarments of, of women's um, and look at them in the mirror. Uh, I think he's, is he putting lipstick on at one point? I can't remember. It's so crazy. Uh, and then he's also got like this, um, Harley Quinn budget prototype going mm -hmm. who hangs out with him all the time. This woman in pigtails who um, is carrying very around a teddy bear the whole time. It's very childlike, but also like mm -hmm. pours his drinks and then like cleans up after him. And, and he's, he just like all of this stuff. It happens on a stage. You have a static camera looking in one direction. Characters move left to right. Um, there's lots of unmotivated movement, meaning that, like he'll be monologuing, but he'll also be doing fiddling with something because Make up some roses, you know? <laughs> right, like, and which yeah. makes sense because when you're on a stage play, it's tiresome to have somebody standing in one place talking as they would in real life. So you have this forced movement. And there's, I mean, it gets even more extreme with the theater stage setup because early on, when we're introduced to Hitler, the first thing that happens is three of these gang members who lost the drugs show up and there's three spotlights in a completely black space and they start like, and they run up one by one into these spotlights and then shuffle as they're talking about, oh no, we're gonna get, Hitler's gonna be mad, which is the most hilarious like quote ever. I just want their little snippets to be my, my ringtone, like Hitler's gonna be mad, Ooh. Uh, But it's, it's a stage show. And so it was really weird because uh, a martial arts film does not mesh well with the stage show setup mm -hmm. and the fight scenes are very 3d all over the place characters yeah. are, are here there everywhere coming at you going away from you across from you and then it gets back to the directing and you have these static cameras with uh, no movement or, or yeah. you know forced linear movement it's very strange and so i don't know i'd like I have to, to disagree with you here on this this point okay i think it works really well and it's actually okay. one of the reasons i love this film <laughs> because Here's the thing. You have these, like, you know, the, the choreographed fight scenes. They're mm -hmm. almost a little awkward. It's kind of like when a bunch of people just start singing all of a sudden, right? Yep. Like, you get that, like, kind of right. musical feel where, like, this choreographed fight scene starts. You're like, well, this doesn't seem in place. Mm -hmm. And this kind of, that, like, that stage theater, what I describe as, like, a surreal, is so surreal. Like, that whole Hitler, like, every time he's in a scene, it's so surreal. And I love it because it kind of sets the tone for those fight scenes. It's like, it's like, all right, this weird, surreal, like theater thing just happened with guys running around in to like different spotlights for whatever reason, this weird, like surreal thing. And then there's like a fight. It just, I don't know. It works for me. It like gets me into the tone where I'm like, oh, I'm totally into this fight scene now. Like That's this interesting. weird I freaking world <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. People are monologuing all the time. Why doesn't anybody respond to what they're saying? <laughs> okay. I love it. <laughs> I, uh, that's a really good question. And I have to say, I, didn't, I don't hate the theatrical thing, but I think what didn't work for me is the fact that 
Uh, it's so clearly filmed in several in several units where characters never interact with each other. Um, yeah. The 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 Hitler character, Korn, uh, Nemec's character, like he's he's in a scene with a couple of like I think the girls at one point and one of the characters from the foster home, but none of the main characters is he ever in contact with. Um, they're all filmed separate locations very clearly at one time. Um, and so that feels pieced together, which is something I didn't really notice mm. before. Um, I, I just have to say, as you said, why is no one talking to each other? They're just <laughs> talking. There's, there's one case where they do seem to respond directly to each other and it goes horribly wrong in the best way. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play that for you right now um yeah here we go the first character talking is pinoy They're, the the uh, uh the, the good guys are facing off against the bad team who is coming to get their drugs back in the front yard of the foster home here we go yeah good christian thou should not kill or be killed no he's the motherfucker right there he's the one i fuck mothers too Oh, man. <laughs> Look, you fuck your mothers. Okay, so for the listening audience, let's unpack what just happened here. Okay, <laughs> they're facing off. The guy's like, give me my drugs. And uh, Pinoy's character says, which is hard to understand at first, he says, uh, uh, are you a good Christian? Thou shalt not kill. Then another of the opposing gang team says, that's the motherfucker right there. He's got our stuff or whatever. Then the, uh, the out of the blue, he's like, that's the motherfucker. And then the guy who's standing in front of Ernie Ray Sr. goes, I fuck mothers too. <laughs> Un unprovoked, unprovoked. And then Ernie Ray Sr. leans over and goes, I'd like to see you fuck your mother or some weird shit like that. And then stabs him in the neck with a cocktail toothpick. It was <laughs> goddamn perfect. That is the most insane. That is David Lynch. <laughs> David Lynch could not hope to aspire to that level of insanity. We Nate, have, do you? Oh, do you understand why I love this movie so much? Oh, you have to take it. Everyone should take a step back. This is one of those movies. Honestly, you can't describe this movie. This is a movie that has stuck with me in my mind for over 15 years. This movie is one of the reasons why I got into martial arts in the first place. This movie is an inspiration <laughs> to some of our filmmaking later in life. This, you step back and you realize this is a movie about Kung Fu kids who drug run, possibly pimp out their sisters for sex. There's a, the antagonist is a Hitler knockoff who has five followers total. <laughs> and let's not even we haven't even gotten to the most bad this is the most cohesive bat shit plot i had ever seen in a movie and i mean cohesive i mean there is a plot there is character development there is character monologue and dialogue i mean <laughs> you know dialogue. yeah well bear with me here <laughs> and somehow this whole thing actually comes together with all the ad-libbing, with all the swears, with all the nonsensical stuff going on, with the fact that the, the, the antagonist at some point decides that he needs to walk into a corner and jack off on the corner and yep. perform a martial arts kick while doing it. And you just sit back, instead what? of sitting back going, what the fuck is going on? You just sit back and go, this is fucking amazing. Let's, <laughs> let's, talk, about, let's talk about that scene because this, you... <laughs> People will be like, I need context. No, that's actually what happened. There's, that's the uh, he has some monologues, that Hitler has some monologues in the warehouse. Then they, I guess, walk outside of the warehouse. I'm not sure why his men are all of a sudden fighting some other men that were standing there, except for the fact that it begins by Hitler like hustling like he's about to have diarrhea on himself into the corner of a wall. This is the daytime. This is bright daytime. And then furiously jacks off into the corner of the wall. And then these other guys attack his guys. And there's this fight scene, which at one point he sort of donkey kicks a guy behind him. And I guess yes. finishes masturbating. Yes. Yes. And then, then finishes. We zips up and yells, Godfather! <laughs> so what I love about this is I want, is 
in one case, I want to show every neo-Nazi in the world this film because it is the most degrading thing to the name of Hitler to have happened since the actual Hitler. Like, um, we do have some problematic things with that the the trope of making the villains feminine. You know, it's like you can you know, or 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 seeming gay. Although he has sex with his like Harley Quinn, you know, uh, knockoff. So he's perhaps by, by sexual, but he's very feminine and it's played that way. And I mean, some people will find offense with that, understandably. However, his character is so fucking batshit nuts that it's just, he's, he's, it's a mockery 100%. Like there's no way. Also his entire crew are multi-ethnic. He has like a black mm. follower with dreads. He has a bunch of Asian uh, people who follow him. He does have like one blonde kid following him. And then he has a couple of like, uh, he has a, the, the one like, you know, the, the super strong mini boss um, guy. And, oh. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> that is him. And it, I don't know, like, and he still calls them like racial, like he still says things like the pure race and like, it's the problem of these. And he goes off on these like uh, it rants. As makes he's looking, no fucking sense. It makes no sense. And it, it totally, it totally adds something. Um, let's, there's a clip of one of his rants and we have to discuss the action that happens in this rant as well. Let's take a listen. We've broken their rhythm. It's time to drop the bomb. We will overpower the remaining chinks and then wait for Jesse and his pet monkey to arrive. The two men will eliminate Senior. The old woman is irrelevant. Oh, the second wave is our insurance policy. <sighs> Stay here. Okay, so there, this is Hitler with standing in front of like his, they're in a warehouse, but he has like couches and display cases there. I don't understand his setup, but he's, he's in front of the couch doing this monologue um, in which I just have to say, I love that he says, um, we've broken their rhythm. It's time to drop the bomb. Like, I, I think those might've been the only two written pieces of dialogue in the whole film. And then everything else is ad lib. But he's doing this thing, walking back and forth, um, his his bodyguards in the corner, and then on the couch behind him is his like Harley Quinn doll, who is masturbating with Ben Wah balls, those metal balls that are meant to be put in the vagina <laughs> and and move around and, and enhance sex. And so she's doing that. And the only reason we know that is because she's kind of throbbing, but it's hard to tell in this, you know, poor quality film. And except for then at the end, the sounds you hear are him walking over to her, apparently thrusting his hand into her vagina and pulling out the balls, which you hear clink. And then he hands them back to her and, and walks off. And that's like, and then he has them at another point in time and he hands them again. I don't know how he got them back. I don't know what mystic Hitler energy caused those to reappear in his possession. Um, but I just, that is, I want to know who's responsible for that. I need Cocaine. to know. Cocaine who, is responsible. Like, like Ernie Reyes. And, and, and when you said, Tab, that this is like everyone's movie. And let's remember, Ernie Reyes Jr. is also uh, probably most well known for Surf Ninjas. Okay, which is um, the the fantastic like um, uh, so, like what was the other Sidekicks is the other movie right? The slightly yep. better and Surf Ninjas was like the knockoff, but still a lot of fun for kids. Like you know, <laughs> oh we're kids and we do kung fu and we're fun. It's like we're Ninja Turtles, but we're not turtles and we don't live in the sewer and we don't have a dad. So it's like we've it's like those movies. This still feels like those movies, even mm -hmm. though. They have yes. racial slurs. They curse constantly. The kids mm -hmm. do nothing but chain smoke, drink coffee, and uh, suggest that they're going to sleep with each other. Like that's that's literally and sell drugs. Cringeworthy, family. Cringeworthy. That's all yes. they do, and yet it feels somehow wholesome because it's so. It's like a child's vision of what it's like to be gangsta. Like, and, and it's so <laughs> 90s that like, you just, people are just like beatboxing on their own. Mm -hmm. Ernie Mays Jr., his, his, the most of his lines are just <laughs> like, just this, this laughing, like cocky thing. He has a shirt off the whole time, first after, after the opening scene. Um, and he just sits on furniture while people do things. And I really give him credit 
for giving the better role to uh, to the lead, Pinoy. Like Pinoy is really the lead, um, not not Ernie Reyes Jr. And he should be. He's fantastic. Uh, his martial arts are amazing. Watching him, we do a lot of watching him just work out in the yard. Uh, and he's not a big guy. He's very small, but mm-hmm. he's obviously super fit. They're both pretty small, super fit. And I mean, he 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 looks like a master. Uh, I don't know much about martial arts other than I obsess over it in films like this, and he he wins it for me. Um, Ernie Ray Sr. is uh, mostly responsible for the choreography. I like the choreography in this film. It's it's very it's much more contemporary in style than uh, Undefeatable, even though it's like five years different. And I think it's because there's a lot of um, double jump kicks in the air, you know, split kicks, things that probably I would hazard to say are not super effective in real life but are pretty great to watch happen on camera yeah mm. i think oh, so well the the one thing and, t- and jeff you said that you were like yeah they, they were kind of okay in some regards i i think what you might be referring to is it's that whole syndrome where no one really interacts with each other beyond their immediate enemy like there's a big fight going on but it's really three fights that are happening sort of adjacent to each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's like, it's much easier to get across in a cartoon where it's like, you know, we can pretend we're in a completely different place, but it's a lot harder to do when you're just fighting in front of a, you know, small time dairy farm uh, in the grass and rolling around in the grass on a picnic table and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, again, like I really do enjoy the kind of stud people doing the action, you know, it's, it, it makes it a lot more fun to watch because it's not like constantly cutting the kind of odd angles uh, to kind of make it feel cohesive. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's really just like one shot and you like see legitimately talented people performing in martial arts. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I mean, I, I, I very much enjoyed the, the fight scenes in this, in this film. Um, I, I would, I would say that, uh, yeah, like the thing that really drew me in, in my opinion, was like, and you guys asked, where did this come from? Like this character of Hitler. I think it came from somebody watching like 1970s Fat Man and then the producers by Mel Brooks, like in one <laughs> evening. And they're like, oh, like this is a thing. You create like this awkward Hitler comic book villain. And then have some fighting on the side. It's brilliant. I think it, I think it. I think it's amazing. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's that's the only way reason I can uh, imagine this actually came up. Maybe some mushrooms. But. I think. So I think Nate, you, yes. I'm gonna blow your mind a little bit. All right. Let's let's try and put this whole movie into some context. Imagine in your head that this movie is a semi sequel to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the first one. Bear okay. with me. All right. All those kids in the Foot Clan, all the ones that were just, you know, drinking and smoking and all that downstairs, <laughs> they're the washouts of the Foot Clan. Th- these kids, they're, they're all washouts. They moved to a different state. They don't, you know, instead of the shredder, you got Hitler. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. And this could literally be it canon. It exists in the same universe. This could literally could. be canon. Could. You know, the whole thing goes down. <laughs> Pinoy gets, you know, he, he marries his, the, the 15 year old who's always hitting on him. And uh, they, they, they move somewhere quiet where people won't mind the age gap. Ernie Ray's junior character uh, leaves after his dad pushes him too far, one too many times and goes, and the only work he can get to get his one room apartment in New York is a pizza delivery guy, at which point he meets Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, and Mikey. And I think that's it. I love it. Mm-hmm. I absolutely am a huge fan. We just, we just, we just solved the, solved the mystery. Cause I mean, how many times did you, wa- were you, you know, were you thinking when you were watching this movie is this sure feels like Ninja Turtles one or two constantly. I mean, it really I mean does. that's, but I mean, considering the writing and the production and who, who was involved, yeah. it had a lot of that feel. Well, and it's, and that's the thing. And I mean, the, the dialogue is of course, and the story arc is not anywhere near as competent as Ninja Turtles, but <laughs> it's, uh, it, it feels like that because there's this weird sense of fun. Like you never really feel like anyone's in imminent danger. Um, I like, I mean, even the most, the most gruesome thing is when, uh, is when the, um, the wise father figure of the film stabs a teenager in the neck with a cocktail 
uh, cocktail toothpick. And that's the most bizarre scene. But uh, after that, the only time is you think there's that, uh, the, the fight with uh, uh, Kimo, who's, who really is friggin' huge, um, who I think it, it, he's fighting Ernie Ray's senior, and you think he may have killed him. At least I was wondering if he killed him, trying to remember, because he gets beaten quite severely. They don't actually show him. And then at the end, oh, I guess I guess he's fine. I don't know. I, I don't mm-hmm. know how this. I don't know. He how, was walking uh, with a cane, but uh, that's true. Alive. That's true. So yeah. So the, can we talk about the ending of this movie? So the ending of no, let's not do that. <laughs> you know, it's not a perfect film. We just <laughs> skip the ending. <laughs> so didn't need one. The end. And it doesn't have one. So, so it, it, kind of, it kind of does, right? Like the thing that like Undefeated was a treat for me because it's one of these movies that really did have a definitive end, right? Like, and a, and a, and a satisfying one. There's a gruesome, unnecessarily vicious end to this serial killer who's essentially just a, a very uh, sick, mentally ill person who happens to be violent, right? Like that's... That's really how they end. Like this man has severe mental problems uh, and he's caused several deaths. Let's hang him by his eye socket until dead. Like that's a gruesome end. Whereas when we get to, uh, we get to the ultimate fight, the, the ending is sort of just that punch and you're down. I don't even know what happens. Like the last one to go is, is, um, is, is Kimo and he is knocked out of a hayloft, right? Onto the ground. Yep. And then Ernie Reyes Jr. jumps after him to I assume land on him but we don't see it. The next scene we see is Pinoy looking down on them from the hayloft and you've got Ernie Reyes Jr. just standing over him, spread like spread legged, like looking down at him. I don't know what happened. Did Kimo have a heart attack? Did all of the steroids finally crush his you know, aorta? I don't, I don't know how that, I don't know what happened. Okay, but we assume he's down for the count or dead or whatever. What they did with the bodies, I have no concept. Uh, but that's, that's not really the end because then we have the scene where Hitler has escaped uh, and he's because he was never in this room with the same people anyway. Uh, he's escaped to back to his warehouse where um, this large black man who is a character in theory, but really we just see him a couple of times by himself with two bodyguards talking on the phone to Hitler, like, You got my stuff, and Hitler's like, nah, I'll get your stuff. Like, that's the only time we see him, but he's there, and then you expect him to like kill or threaten Hitler and like have a fade out. And you do get a fade out, but it's of the man turning to face Hitler and forcing Corinne Nemec's character to his knees. And I'm like, are we, are we supposed to assume that he's forcing him to give a blowjob? Like that's actually what it looks like. I I was assuming it's death by deep throat, but (laughs) because that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. And I don't know if it's intentional. It's not clear enough if it's intentional yeah. or it's just he's supposed to be choking him or if he's like, hmm, like, good thing you wore the red bra. That's a way bra. to asphyxiate, though. I don't know. I, I, so, so that was, I don't know, I don't know, Tab, what was your impression? Was that, or is he just dead? Or what are we, what are we supposed to get from that? I think it's uh, a combination of both. Because after all, remember the character you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And don't forget the entire nipple torture scene oh. that was after the whole thing with the jacking off in the corner. Right. Let's let's hold off on that for a second because uh, uh, that scene that scene where he is forced to apparently give fellatio uh, to his employer. That's not the end either, because then we get another scene <laughs> where uh, they're back at at the uh, foster home, and uh, which by the way, no no one's ever going to take these children. Well, number one, they're almost eighteen. Number two. They're still, I still don't know what they're doing. They're, they're, why did she as a hooker use the window to come home instead of the door? I don't understand that either. Like they all live there. But we, we get a scene of them at the house, Ernie Mays Jr. looking for Pinoy. And they're like, he's gone, man. He left. And he's like, what? And then we get a scene of them driving around town at night. Everyone, the old lady, uh, Ernie Mays Sr. who's now walking with a cane. And uh, Pinoy is like <clears throat> standing on a loading dock with like, uh, uh, some homeless person's blanket that he stole that looks like a Christmas blanket. And and they're like, where'd you go, man? And they basically give him shit for leaving. And he's like, well, I cause problems everywhere I go, which has not really been an issue through this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Except for the fact that he doesn't speak English and doesn't know why everyone attacks him every second of the day. Okay, so that could be a problem. <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's like, and then Ernie Reyes Jr., I kind of expect him to his character to be like, 
dude, you can't leave us like that. You've got to come back, man. We need you. But no, he says, I could kick your ass. I'm the new Pinoy. I don't give a shit. And, and he's like, that's and a genuine response, though. <laughs> and, and that, yeah. And then Ernie Ray Sr. is like, you have to come help these kids. And I'm like, yeah, because clearly you're not doing it. Like, you're like, these kids need help. So I'm going to protect their drug stealing ass and allow them to hook at 15. I, I don't understand. This is not a safe place for children. Like, this, this, sh this foster home should be shut down. Like, this is a terrible... <laughs> I don't, I don't know who's taking care of the animals. They're not the good guys. Like, no. <laughs> it, it's, it's insane. Okay. And then, like, I guess they convince Pinoy to come back. That, that's it. And I'm like, that's the ending. And I'm like, what? I, okay. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to watch this movie again many times. And I'm yes. just going to stop it before that scene. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, it's <laughs> I'm just gonna. <laughs> it's just like, not necessary. It's like if you gave the end of, uh, of, uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, um, some sort of of, uh, of diuretic, and it just <laughs> went forever, more and more and more. Like it no, never wasn't emotional somehow. <laughs> somehow, like you went through this whole journey with them, and, but then there was no emotion of it no, at all. No growth, nothing. Ernie Reyes Jr. Yeah. is no is not a different nothing. person. He's not a different person. He's still a little shit. Um, the, 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 and I should use her name because she actually was probably the, one of the strongest actors in there is, um, is it, is it Karen or Katie I, or Susan? I think it's Susan. It's Susan. Susan. Yeah. Uh, I looked her up. I, she didn't seem to have a lot of credits. No, she, she did a, a couple of TV shows. She did Jeremiah and Andromeda, uh, but not too much. And she's played, she played stripper number four in John Doe in 2002, which is unfortunate because she was pretty good. You know, very pretty. She was good up until that last scene. She wasn't very good. That, <laughs> that whole last scene was a mess. The whole last scene was a true mess. It was yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't know. I think it, this is what it felt like. It felt like um, Pinoy's backstory is actually Shashir in Akala's real life. Like they literally were like, he just showed up from the Philippines and walked into a sandwich shop where Ernie Reyes Jr. and Senior were having lunch and was like, can I have a job? And they were like, we've got a job for you. Come with us. And he didn't know what was happening. He didn't understand. And they just threw him in front of people that were swinging at him for, uh, I'm estimating a 14 day shoot. And, and we just went with it. Like, that's what it feels like. Um, and yeah. then he actually ran off and then they drove and found him and were like, get in the car. And he's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want anything. I, I take the blanket back and like get in the car. So I think that's the true ending to this film. Mm. Um, <laughs> Very possibly. I mean, I take a more realistic approach to it is this, you know, group of writers and directors and actors, you know, mostly the same person just has no, talent for kind of like the emotional and philosophical kind of conclusions and climaxes right, right. yeah and it just you know clearly the talents lie somewhere else because they made they made a very entertaining film that's just madness but like you know <laughs> when you, you try to get like that touchy-feely like friends are and family are important and like you know there's some sort of philosophical process involved you know all that stuff just falls completely dead uh -huh. uh, just didn't have the you know the right ideas well, and execution on how to like uh, bring those to conclusion yeah no i think i think you're right i think that they're like we need some sort of ending and then it was like uh here it is and they're like well this isn't really an ending but i'm pretty sure an hour and 47 minutes in most people will stop watching so yeah. we're gonna go with it um and that's what happened and so that that was a little upsetting to me um but the well, i mean like if you took like the like the pinoy story out of it it's literally hooligans foster children steal cocaine uh battle between gangs ensues that's the entire plot yep <laughs> there's, there's nothing else to it what do you need what else do you need exactly and it, and it works somehow like you know <laughs> what i mean it's just like it's just madness and silly and strange things happening like uh you know uh, the producers in uh, <laughs> 1970s played by batman spring <laughs> time for hitler yeah. <laughs> spring <laughs> time for hitler uh yeah i i think um and, and this is one of those films, both of them actually are films where uh, a lot of the cast really 
has no like their their trail sort of goes cold in the mid 2000s and it's very hard to find information on them um which is you know unfortunate uh because i think some of them uh like uh melissa barker sauer who played uh susan uh would be is, is probably pretty good um mm-hmm. she she she's a good actress um i just if you i don't know if sometimes these film projects sour people on it or if they just never get enough money or oftentimes i do know that they hire locals where they're filming so oftentimes those people are not going to relocate to la uh and that could be it as well but it is it is interesting to find people and be like huh so hitler's working but teenage hooker's not working uh ernie race jr can we just mention to um the uh robin webb he is the uh heavy set um uk uh karate instructor who uh gets his ass handed to him and they pretend like he's being smug but ernie reyes jr really just just sets him up and belittles him (laughs) because he is pretty (laughs) he is pretty good at kung fu or excuse me kung fu that's inappropriate karate Karate. um and uh and then he gets his ass handed to him by pinoy who again does not know why he's beating someone up and <laughs> and, and, and Robin Webb, it's nice to see him because he's actually a stunt coordinator and he's stunt coordinator on this film, but he's done a lot uh, of, of stunt, stunt stuff. Um, he was uh, in uh, Bird on a Wire uh, with Mel and, uh, Mel, uh, and Goldie Hawn. Um, so he's done, he's done a lot of stuff. Uh, Walking Tall, the remake, he did that as well. He was, he was, uh, he was a stunt person in that, but I have a feeling he's, he's done a lot of stunt work. So he takes those leads and it's, it's nice to see those people, as, as you said, Jeff, in front of the camera for once. Um, cause, cause he was fine. He actually did a good job. Um, I had trouble placing his accent at first. I couldn't tell if it was a speech impediment because he's, he's talking about karate, but with this heavy UK accent, I was like, Oh, he's Australian. So, uh, uh, yeah. Don't know. Don't know about that. Thought he was just talking like he had sleep apnea while awake. <laughs> yeah, he kind of <laughs> does that too. Um, so, there's another. Let's let's talk about the nipple scene. Tad, set us up for this because I had forgotten oh, until you mentioned this scene. We're going back in time. So I don't know what exactly uh, the point. I mean, there doesn't have to be a point to anything that Hitler does in this movie. It's just largely entertaining anytime you see him on screen, even though the acting is not fantastic. And by the way, as someone who wa- grew up watching Parker Lewis Can't Lose, the realization, I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, Parker Lewis is Hitler? Yes, what the yes. Fuck? Yeah. Extra, extra special surprise. So I got the feeling that they, they, I felt like they were trying to establish his bisexuality by... First, he's got this uh, this uh, playboy centerfoldish looking person as his secretary, but then, well, he's got a an underling who is topless and uh, uh, strapped to a table, I guess, and he's literally caressing the man and tor- nipple torturing him by just grabbing him and just squeezing as hard as he can, and. I don't even remember what the hell he was talking about because nothing that the Hitler character says unless it's actually something lifted out of an actual Hitler speech, which totally did happen, which led to one of my favorite quotes in the entire movie, which was, I remember reading that speech in school. And then the other guy goes, fuck school. And that's it. That, then it just cuts to the next scene. <laughs> it's true. Amazing. Just a that, fucking amazing. So yeah, that, that line like kind of really plays to the contrast of both the diversity of the, the people that are in his squad, but also that they're like children. Yeah. <laughs> they're just yeah. kids yes. you know? and they really are like every like most people in this yeah. movie actually appear underage which is concerning on a certain level <laughs> um so i don't know what else to set up because um without actually looking at the non-existent script because i'm pretty sure that anything with uh Nemec on screen was scripted at all except for because i mean remember there's a there's a scene in there where uh, she hands him the phone and the phone just flies, flies off out camera. of his hands. Yeah. Totally just flies not. off camera. 
And I, I instantly, I looked at it, I'm like, that totally was a was supposed to be a blooper reel. And they said, you know what? It's fucking hilarious. Keep it. Just leave it that, yeah. that way because well, it fits with the character so it, well. It does. And he stays in character. I mean, that makes credit. He does a great job. Stay, he never leaves this character. I don't know. He does. I mean, not. I don't, I don't know why you'd want to stay with this character for a great deal of time, but he stays with him. For, I, mean, I guess we are as the audience. Right. Um, but he does. But yeah, there's this nibble like, and, and the, and the, the young guy who he's fondling in a torturous manner, they've like greased him up. So it's just a really hilariously bizarre, bizarre scene. And it's, it's comical and it's weird. And it's also a little long, but it's just, you know. <laughs> There's a weird. lot of things that run a little long in this movie, Nate. And again, he's monologuing. He, the, the, yeah, the whole time. Say a word. The whole time, talking yeah. About, talking about the merchandise, which yeah. apparently all, the, all his followers are mer merchandise too, which again, fits with the character very well. It's true. It's just it's like, true. The, at the whole time, I'm like, he's fondling this guy and he's a martial artist and yeah, he's, he's not too, he's not very fit. Not no, fit compared to, he's, to the rest of the characters. He's 50s but fit, he's a kid. you know? Yeah. 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 Comparatively. It's, it's um, and I, I would love to give the name of the actress who played um, uh, Hitler's, Hitler's uh, secretary, but uh, I have no idea because the names in this film, this is why it pays to watch the credits for movies. And a lot of people don't, but especially these sort of cult films or, or unknown films, because first off, there are over 20 people credited as goon in this film. <laughs> like all these people play goon. Uh, the one difference among these is uh, an actor named John Sampson who plays goon in a suit. I don't know why that's differentiated. There are definitely several goons in suits. I don't know. Um, I would think perhaps it's because uh, he's actually, uh, John uh, Sampson actually has done uh, a good Julian films as a stuntman. Um, so he was probably a little known in the area. He's also done like over, uh, you know, several dozen acting roles. So he's, he's been a lot, but I don't know why, I guess maybe that's what put him in charge as a, you know, oh, you're going to be the goon in a suit. Trust me, goon in a suit. Because they didn't even number goons. No, they did not. There's too many. Yeah. There's no too goon many. number five. No, there's. I mean, there's only six crazy dragons, the the enemy team. Um, but anyway, so point being, I have no idea who that actress is. Um, I do. Do you? Is it? Daniela I did the research. Andrista? I am. I am. Ninety-eight percent sure that that is Julia K. Smith, who I looked it up. That comment that I had before about Playboy Centerfold, I wasn't making that up. I believe, if I read her credits right, she actually was in Playboy at one point, and she has a large uh, credit roll of very bad skin flick B movies. Yeah. And I believe she actually worked with Russ Meyer at some point. You were right; she did. She also, I know her. I can't believe I didn't realize it. Yes, it's also uh, she worked with Julie Strain a lot. She did a lot of Andy Sedaris films, like Day of the Warrior. Um, so yeah, so it's interesting to see her in that because she, and by the way, I apologize to our listeners. I forgot a fourth ending to this movie. There is, there is the ending um, preceding the final um, uh, tracking Pinoy down to the alleyway uh, where uh, this character, who you're right, is titled Secretary, um, is dressed in bright clothes, sitting in a tree next to the road with her teddy bear and hails a taxi, right? Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. She hails a taxi, gets into the taxi, and what, I don't even remember what she says, um, but she's, she's going to Disneyland, I, 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 and, that's, and she drives off. I don't really, I, I, here's, I'm going to be honest, I would like to see her movie, because I don't know <laughs> what her motivation is, where she came from. No Why clue. she was crossing and uncrossing her legs incessantly in the first scene she's in. I, I don't know. Something sexual. Sure, and she, and I mean, you know that. I, I mean, to, I have to go through it again. <laughs> and to be to be fair to her, I mean, they clearly they were like, look, you have to have we have to have something going in while this guy is babbling nonsensically for three to four minutes at a time, like so just do something. And she does. She's a focal point. She provides mm -hmm. all of the you know oh shit cat in a window shots. You know we needed to edit here. Let's just show her face. You know looking insane or goofy. Um, she did a good job. So. Uh, kudos to that but yeah that's yet another ending in there uh, that I, I missed I can't believe I missed that except for they the fact wrapped, that there are so many they wrapped up <laughs> every loose end every loose end was wrapped up whether you wanted it or not it's true it's true I, the 
And it, it should be, it's important to say too, uh, to give full credit that Ernie Reyes Jr. is uh, only the co-author on this film. Um, Manu Tupau, who died in 2004, and I, I may be misstating his name as well. Um, he's a, a, an actor from Fiji. Uh, he has been acting for, or had been acting for many years since the 60s. Um, and he's been in so many things. The original A-Team, Hill Street Blues. He played a Native American a lot. Um, and uh, he was he was Ubu in uh, one episode of Batman the animated series, which made me happy because I was like, oh, I know that. <laughs> so he, he's he's been a lot of stuff. He's also um, uh, apparently his only writing credit was uh, this movie. I don't know. I, again, I wish I could see the script for this film because I have a sneaking suspicion that it's uh, it's uh, one page and a blank sheet of paper. And, uh, and, and Ernie Ray says, motherfucker, just wh when the, if, if you don't know what your lines are, just be like, motherfucker. motherfucker. Yeah. It's instead of a drag queen mouthing along to a song saying watermelon, it's just Ernie Ray's junior looking at the camera <laughs> going, motherfucker, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Did no, you, I, did you, I noticed, and it, when you played the clip, I didn't hear it the first time I was watching the movie, but I'm, pr but remember when he's like taunting the, the kids to, yeah. to get them to chase him? The, the I'm pretty dragons. sure he's like, yeah, stick my dick in your ass. He said it really low so you could barely hear it, but I heard it at that time. Is, I'm like, oh, I missed there, that. Yeah. It is there. Yeah, no, they, they definitely did like a, uh, several rounds of looping over that because they're just people saying things. <laughs> um, there's a lot of ADR in this film, you know, uh, dialogue recorded afterward that, um, I don't really, it, it's not, it's not very good in that it's too clean. Um, but I would rather that than, you know, uh, really, than just really poor audio like Shark Exorcist, which I could understand, but was just so uneven. Um, I will, I will give them credit for at least doing ADR so I could understand what they're saying, but it, it often sounds like they're, you know, they're in a recording booth rather than on set. Um, the other thing is, I, I want to give credit to the folly work in this movie. Those sound effects are perfect. They're absolutely critical, especially in um, Kimo's fight scene in the barn uh, near the end of the film. Like every fist, flying fist, gets a you know whoosh. Every foot pound gets the perfect sound. Like it's it's on point. Like they did not mess around with that. Um, and I, I don't know uh, exactly who to credit with that. Uh, it could be several people, but uh, well, no, it really couldn't. I guess Daryl Bennett was both the music supervisor and sound designer. He did a great job with that. So, and that's really important when you watch that film. If you turn, you know, if you throw a, a fight scene like that on mute and you don't hear any exaggerated sound or, or you know, uh, fist hitting a side of beef or something, it's it's missing. You're gonna you're gonna be unhappy with it. So, good on them. Uh, the other thing we didn't really talk about yet, we kind of mentioned it, is um, the, the strange Christian references in this film. Um, it's, it, mm. yeah, so, so uh, Ernie Reyes Jr., I assume, I, I'm a big fan, I assume he's fairly religious um, because he did, he, he starred in a, a, a sort of Christian-themed um, uh, film, uh, called the secret of the horse it's a short film but it, it kind of got a little bit of note so i don't know if that's i don't know if that's one of his things but in this film there's a lot of pictures of jesus and they try i think kind of unsuccessfully to make pinoy a jesus character because he's told you know by his uh his father figure in the philippines to go uh show others the light and then there's this weird scene where he first shows up at the breakfast table at the uh the foster home and Ernie Ray senior who runs the place sees him and just instantly attacks him. And then once he like successfully defends himself, he's like, just nods like, yep, everything's great. But in the meantime, in the film, a knife has been driven into a portrait of Christ on the wall. And, and he's been, laughing. And he's laughing. And uh, of course, Ernie Ray's junior is laughing his head off. And, uh, and Pinoy is just staring at this knife stuck in next to Jesus head, just kind of, I guess horrified. I don't. I don't really know. I mean, it's the most honest response. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, but what cracks me up is that if you go on the reviews for this film, you will see several of people who uh, watch The Secret of the Horse being very upset by this movie, which cracks me up because mm. I don't know what about a film called The Ultimate Fight really drives you to think that there's a strong religious message of any kind 
Um, I think you're looking in the wrong book. Are you yeah. sure this isn't just a bunch of trolling, Nate? Because I read a couple of those reviews and I felt like it was uh, Troll Central. Oh, there are a lot of trolls, but I mean, you know, we're talking, we're talking that, uh, you know, there is a film uh, that, that Ernie Reyes Jr. was in and it, it is fairly religious in tone. So I don't know if, uh, I don't know. We can also talk about real quick, Ernie Reyes Jr. I'm just trying to find places that people will know him from because he is very recognizable. And I think a lot of people don't know his name, but would recognize him as an actor. He plays Prince Tarn in Red Sonja uh, from 1985 with, with Schwarzenegger and Bridget Nielsen, which you may not know, but you should. Mm -hmm. um, the most troublesome one is he's, he, plays, uh, he plays a character called Manito in uh, the, the Dwayne The Rock Johnson film, The Rundown. And that's a weird one because he does great. He, of course, does action scenes, great stunts. He's totally jacked. But he basically is, is a, an Asian man in blackface in that film. It's the weirdest like, I, that wouldn't fly today. I mean, it's only, you know, it's about 17 years ago, but that just would not happen uh, to see him painted up as an aboriginal uh, Amazon jungle dweller. It was a weird, it was a weird one. Uh, but I do remember seeing it in theaters and being so excited because I was like, it's Ernie Ray's Jr. because I hadn't seen him in so long. And, uh, and you know, despite the problematic uh, casting, he is, uh, he is an actor of color and he's a great one, so there there mm. that's it that's it that's it go watch surf so, ninjas so i wanted to just just as a serious note uh, as serious as i possibly can be i am a martial artist i'm not claiming to be a great one or even a good one but i am one and uh it was very interesting going back to this movie after 15 plus years from the perspective of martial artist because i'm always interested now looking back at these movies, especially when there are professional martial artists in these films and performing choreography, I like to see, and now I can recognize what's real and what is clearly for show. And uh, for any listeners who are interested in martial arts, um, I originally went into this movie going, I wonder if uh, there's going to be any references, or maybe this is the most shorthanded reference to Remy Pressus ever. And if you do not know Remy Pressus, fantastic martial artist, look him up. Uh, he actually directly taught my sensei that I currently have for maybe a couple of years off and on. Basically the Bruce Lee of Filipino martial arts. Uh, no joke. And uh, that's what I thought because the movie started off with a scream of sticks, clearly our niece, clearly big uh, Philippines flag in the background. I was like, it's coming to America story. Um, cause Remy Pressus actually left the country under very, very bizarre circumstances because it, it was, it was back in the time when Philippine Filipino polit uh, politics was, I guess you could say it was sort of influenced by everything that was going on in post Vietnam. Uh, government was very much trying to make Arnis a, you know, a national sport and nationalize it, Some, similar to the way that China's doing with Tai Chi now. The problem with that is that inevitably what government does is they nominate someone who's obviously not in a martial art. Prem didn't like that. And uh, someone tried to kill him, so he left. And uh, I, I, so I wanted to see some of this in this movie. I don't know if, if uh, Ernie Reyes Jr. tried to sort of at least allude to that, but uh, it, it, was a, it was a miserable failure if he did. Well, But there was Arnie. Yes, and I will say it is nice that uh, it does, they do give a little bit of a Filipino identity in this film, and they actually mention Arnise by name, which I, I can't think of a film uh, of that era or this one that even mentions it, uh, despite the fact that it's pretty influential. So uh, that's a, that was a nice feature, um, even if the uh, social impact is not at all attempted in this film. And I don't think I need to say that. Uh, so yeah, so if you, you know, I, th I think, I think I'll start off this one, um, the ultimate fight. I'd recommend it to people who love Ernie Reyes Jr., love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle films from the nineties and, uh, anyone who's interested in, uh, seeing a multi-ethnic cast, including Hitler who curses, uh, and, and wears ladies undergarments for pleasure. He does a lot of cocaine. He does do a lot of cocaine. Actually, he does a little bit of cocaine a lot. Like his ring is always empty and he's always upset about it. Yes, um, fill this ring. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I thought he was planning to sell the merchandise. But... All right, Je- uh, Jeff, who would you recommend this film to? Oh man, you know what? I, I love this film. And so I'm going to recommend it to anyone. And I'll tell you why. Because if you can get through and you have like a sense of humor and you can avoid being like extremely, you know, uh, offended by anything and you get to the end, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be a, uh, an enjoyable ride. Uh, if you didn't and you hated it, sorry. <laughs> but it's worth the risk. It's worth the risk. That's my assessment. Tab? You bitch ass mother, you bitch ass motherfucker. You stole my thunder. <laughs> sucker but um it i have the same sentiment i think honestly watch if if I'm, I'm, you know if you're one to enjoy this type of humor watch it watch it multiple times and especially now that i put it in your head watch it after you watch the first ninja turtles and try and pretend that everybody in this cast is a foot clan loser knockoff who just basically couldn't cut it in the real clan <laughs> well, that is uh, an excellent note to end on, and I don't need any more encouragement to watch uh, Ninja Turtles again ever. Uh, and uh, that's Let's do that's it right all. Now. Uh, uh, sounds good to me. Uh, <laughs> this is this has been Colton Classic. Thank you guys so much again. Uh, every clip in this show is uh, used for review purposes and is the uh, property of the owners and distributors of those films. Play us out is the Chud. And let's all give them a big hand. Thank you so much to the Chud for letting us use their music. And you can find them at www.facebook.com slash the Chud Band. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please rate us on the podcast provider of your choice and donate at www.cultandclassicpodcast.com. This is Nate Wyckoff signing off. <laughs>